Okay, I've, uh, I'm usually asked at the end of these congresses to say a little bit about what I've learned. Hmm? But zuerst möchte ich meine Dankbarkeit uh, ausdrücken, meine, unsere Dankbarkeit für all diejenigen, die diese fantastische Konferenz uh, so schön organisiert haben. Uh, Raimund, uh, Ronald, Matthias, uh, viele andere. Uh, und vor allem vielleicht uh, Dorothee Schulte-Basta, die ihre ganze Kraft in die Vorbereitung dieser uh, Konferenz uh, uh, gegeben hat. Und so viel Kraft, dass es eigentlich keine Kraft mehr übrig blieb, um heute anwesend zu sein. So, zu all diesen Leuten vielen, vielen Dank. Right, so what did I learn? Um, only, I'll only say a few things I've learned. For example, from previous conferences, I learned that uh, Senator Suplicy was a Bob Dylan fan and could sing Bob Dylan. <laughs> at, at, at this conference, I learned that Goethe Werner was a Goethe fan and that he could recite long poems by Goethe. So, <laughs> This uh, is a little bit of the learning I did. But I learned many things. For example, I learned how sophisticated research about basic income uh, had become and needed to become. Because when you want to find out or prove that basic income is a good idea, it's not enough to go to a place to say, I'm making an experiment, you distribute a few euros or rubles or whatever it is, and then you say, you know, they liked it. Huh? All this money, they made good use of it, you know. That's not sufficient. Huh? You need to do something a bit more complicated, more sophisticated. So you need to look at some places, some villages, some neighborhoods where uh, basic income is being introduced, some other places where nothing is done, some, thing, some other places where some other use is made of the money, and that is methodologically a far, far more complicated business. It's even physically a far more complicated business. Guy Standing was explaining yesterday how in the process of his field work, he got with water up to there, or perhaps that's an exaggeration, perhaps up to there, because there was a flood in the village in which he was doing his field work, and he had to lift his computer with all his data above the water so that he would save the what he had learned there uh, from the experiment, but field work and serious work, including about basic income, can be a muddy business, a difficult business in all sorts of ways. And I was, and by looking at the, the results of the pilot studies in India in particular, you could see how much progress was made in this respect, how more seriously the attempts were made to, to test basic income in unexpected uh, places unexpected by us at the beginning of uh, our, our network. But in this uh, short sort of uh, uh, synopsis, as it were, it's a very selective synopsis, I want to focus on only two things, which were themes that ran through a number of the workshops which I attended. The first one, it's very striking, perhaps not surprising in Germany, was the number of papers and number of sessions that touched on the relationship between basic income and ecology, right? But what struck me is that basic income came into that discussion in three very different ways. The first one, the first connection, is related to employment. In fact, at one of the sessions, uh, Carol Pateman or uh, Almas, who was reading Carol Pateman's uh, paper, said, you basic income people, you are too focused on employment. We think on employment and employment. Yes, it's true. Look at this poster, which I picked up. It says, Förderung der Wirtschaft durch sichere Kaufkraft der Bürger. Promotion of the economy by earning power. This will create jobs and preserve jobs. Tom is here being sold to the German population by saying, basic income is good for employment. So, of course, many people in the basic income movement say, in a sense, exactly the opposite. Huh? Freiheit statt voll Beschäftigung, right? 
or freedom instead of full employment. At one of the fascinating sessions at this uh, conference, and it's a new theme, degrowth, degrowth. Uh, so the country of growth, the country of trying to promote employment. And this is indeed one central way in which the connection between basic income and uh, green concerns, uh, ecological concerns, is made. And, and I must say it's one of the ways, central way in which I came to it in the early 80s, so shortly after the, uh, the, the Club of Rome report, etc. And that can be formulated very simply. It says, you know, we need to consume less, we need to produce less, yet we don't want all this involuntary unemployment. We, we want to save the planet, but at the same time, we don't want to be satisfied with all these people excluded from the labor market. What do we need to do to solve it? What will be a clever way of solving it without going for further and further growth? The clever way consists in saying, well, let's turn some of the involuntary unemployment into voluntary unemployment. And let's turn some of the involuntary employment into voluntary unemployment. So that some of the people who work too much and make themselves ill because they work too much could reduce their working time. And some of the people who are ill because they can't find a job could get access to a job because it's being freed by other people, right? But how do you do that? Very simple. The simplest way of doing so is basic income. Bedingungsloses Grundeinkommen. That's the first connection, right? But then there is a second connection, which is quite different. It may converge in the results, and it's a connection that has been discussed very interestingly and surprisingly in some respects uh, at length at the session that just happened uh, this uh, morning by some Austrian and German uh, contributors. And here is the connection. It says, well, you know, our basic problem as far as ecology is concerned, is that we pay certain goods, in fact, all goods that incorporate natural, natural resources or have negative uh, consequences for the environment, we pay them far too little. We don't pay the true cost, the true price that reflects the scarcity of these goods. Uh, what we need to do is try to imagine what these prices should be if we took all the negative externalities on the environment into account of all sorts, acoustic, uh, per, per atmospheric, uh, etc., hmm? including the saturation of uh, the absorption capacity of our atmosphere. And we also need to try to imagine what these prices would be if future generations could also bid for these natural resources which are currently depleting at a fast rate. It's, of course, a speculative exercise, but the conclusion is obvious. We should pay for more for anything that includes natural resources. So it's essential to boost the prices of all these goods. But if you do that, you get massive incomes, massive revenues. But at the same time, of course, prices of all sorts of necessary goods go up very considerably. And you need to protect at least the incomes of the poor against this massive, dramatic increase in the price of natural resources and anything that incorporates them. How do you do that? In a simple way, without creating all sorts of administrative problems. And as the case of Iran uh, interestingly showed, the best, the simplest, the fairest, the more efficient way of doing so is very simple basic income, Grundeinkommen. Okay, that's the second path. But then there is a third path, which has been hardly discussed, and it's the following. It consists in saying, yes, we absolutely need to save the planet. And to do that, we need to organize our planet, not so that we have sustainable development. I think it's a bad expression. What we need is to achieve a sustainably generalizable, the whole of mankind, 
sustainably generalizable way of living, sustainably generalizing standard of living. How are we going to do that? Certainly, like in the degrowth thesis, we need to reduce our consumption. But we don't need to reduce our production. We, by we here, I don't mean we people in the world, I mean people in the north. Why not? Because there are many places in the world where the achievement of a minimally decent standard of living is not within sight with their own uh, development, po developmental possibilities. For all sorts of reasons, some institutional, educational, uh, difficulty of getting a minimally efficient education system going, but uh, sheerly climatic in certain cases because of desertification, because of o overpopulation. So, given that it won't be possible for these countries to achieve this minimally for their huge populations, I'm thinking of sub-Saharan Africa, for example, and their, their fast-growing population, it would be impossible to achieve a decent standard of living there. And at the same time, massive migration of, of hundreds of millions of people out of Africa, out of some other parts of the world, is not desirable either, neither for the places where they come from, nor for, for the communities where they come from, nor where the communities, for the communities where they would need to be integrated. Well, if you honestly see and admit uh, that autonomous or endogenous development is just out, completely out of sight for this century in many places in the world, and you don't want this migration of hundreds of millions of people, what, what follows from that is that we'll only achieve this sustainably uh, uh, generalizable standard of living will only be able to achieve it if there are massive, systematic, constant, permanent transfers uh, from the richer countries, uh, the richer people in the richer countries, to the poor people in many poorer countries. How can that be achieved in a sustainable way? In my own conviction, which I try to uh, spell out to some extent in the light of what's going on within the European Union uh, in the presentation I gave on no Eurozone without Euro dividend. My own conviction is that this can only uh, be achieved on a permanent uh, and, and significant level if it takes the form of transnational interpersonal uh, transfers. That is organized not through transfer from one state budget to another but uh, through a sort of common tax and transfer system as happens within nation states now, as needs to, to happen, among other things, to save the euro at the level of the European Union across the borders of nations. But then you ask, well, how can we organize in a realistic way transfers, interpersonal transfers of that sort? Huh? We are not going to have a, a worldwide uh, healthcare system or pension system uh, uh, earnings related pension system? No. And the answer here, again, is if you think about it, you explore all the alternative ways, the answer is, is again, the simplest, fair, efficient way of doing so is basic income, Grundeinkommen. So you have these three very different ways in which you get uh, from ecological concerns to the idea of a basic income, and with a diff very different sort of argument in each case. In one case, it's really uh, uh, basic income is used as a soft break on growth and a soft way, a flexible way of sharing employment. In the second uh, perspective, it's a way of uh, compensating for the internalization of all sorts of things into the prices of the goods we consume. And in the third case, it has a, a realistic way of doing the sort of transfers which will be necessary to make our planet, to make our uh, humankind a, 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 a sort of an entity where justice, where justice will be minimally uh, satisfied. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Second, uh, more briefly, something that also came up at various uh, uh, the workshops I attended, 
but perhaps most clearly at this interesting exchange there was uh, between uh, the, the workshop with Götz Werner and um, Wolfgang uh, strengmann -Kuhn. Um Here, and also in connection then with Hartsfeer, uh, Hartsfeer, uh, and the big reform of the welfare state under the second uh, government uh, headed by, uh, by Schröder, by Gerhard Schröder. Uh, Hartsfeer has been uh, something fantastic for the popularity of basic income in this country. Uh, so it uh, struck me uh, that, uh, uh, so that at the beginning when we started with the European network in the mid-80s, there was some interest in Germany, uh, in particular on the side of sort of left liberals and uh, of the Greens. Then you had, you Germans had this huge challenge of the Wiedervereinigung, of uh, uh, sort of uh, integrating the East German part of uh, the country into the West German uh, welfare state. That was a huge enterprise that pushed any basic income uh, projects uh, to the side. And uh, then it kept sort of more or less uh, underground for uh, uh, some time. And then, push, you had uh, Hartsfeer, uh, 2005, and you have this sort of accumulation wave of uh, articles, pamphlets, books, uh, <coughs> collected <coughs> volumes, some of which are available here, um, out of reaction against uh, Hartsfeer. Now, what's involved in all that? And it's really very important then to, it helps us focus on what's really crucial to the basic income project, that is, to a form of minimum income that is at the same time universal, that is, it's not means tested, it's given to the rich and to the poor, and unconditional in the sense that you are entitled to it whether you work or not, whether you are willing to uh, work or not, and whether you are disposed to accept any job offered to you or not. Okay? So, universal in this sense and unconditional in this sense. Well, in uh, reaction to Hartsfeer, huh? so Hartsfeer uh, sort of was a move towards what's also called in other contexts workfare, in the sense that there was on the whole uh, a reduction of uh, the benefits that were given to the people uh, who were unemployed or unemployed for a significant uh, time. And at the same time, there, was, there were stronger sanctions if the people didn't accept work. So one of the reactions would consist in saying, uh, drop these sanctions. And so you have these means tested, uh, what used to be called Sozialhilfe, now Arbeitslosengeld uh, uh, Let's keep this, uh, this uh, well, you have this means tested system, but drop the sanctions. Let people there. But if you do that, that is, if you have unconditionality without, without universality, this is a recipe for exclusion because it means you give this handout to the people. These people are stuck there because they have an income, in a benefit that is less than what they could earn on the labor market. So, uh, sorry, that is more than what they could earn on the labor market uh, under, under present conditions because they are low skilled, etc. And you give that to them and you say, shut up. It's not our duty, it's not your duty to look for a job and not, it's not for the duty of society to find a job for you. Just shut up, keep this hand out and keep quiet. That's the, and, uh, so if you have unconditionality without universality, it's a recipe for exclusion. Now, if you have universality without unconditionality, it's a recipe for exploitation. When I had this dialogue with Schroeder in, in Brussels, uh, a couple of months ago, he himself recognized that the combi loan part of Arbeitslosengeld 2, and so the fact that you can combine uh, far more easily than in the past this social health, this social assistance, with a low paid jobs, he recognized himself that this was misbraucht, this was misused by the employers who managed to get people uh, into shitty jobs without any prospects, uh, simply because these people were forced by the sanction to accept it, and it was, of course, a subsidized job because part of it was received, part of their income was given in the form of benefit. 
Okay? So if you have universality without unconditionality, it's a recipe for exploitation. And as I said before, if you have uh, unconditionality without the universality, it's a recipe for exclusion. What you need, of course, is both its universality and non-conditionality, and that's a path to emancipation, huh? because then, of course, it's a way of protecting the income of the people, but without trapping them, them in a situation of exclusion, because you can keep the basic income if you work, but having this basic income enables you huh, to say yes to jobs in a selective way. And I just finished by uh, mentioning what emerged also for uh, from this discussion, including in the, in the plea made on that occasion by uh, Wolfgang, but also by other people in, in other workshops, is that even if the, this basic income, universal and unconditional, is less than what would be a decent level of uh, living, huh? if you had to live of it for the whole of your life, even if it's considerably less, it's certainly not without significance. So, because some people have really very low incomes, but because it enables you, it doesn't enable you to live off it, especially in an expensive place like Munich or, or, or central Frankfurt or whatever, it doesn't enable you to live off it for the whole of your life without doing any work. But it gives you more options. I'm struck uh, now that my children, uh, more or less at the age I had when we founded Bien, and uh, the, that... Um, and they have been in the process of finding jobs and trying to find jobs that would correspond to what they like. I was struck, and I'm sure many of you have that experience, by the fact that uh, the first step into an, in, into employment, if you want to use your previous skills, is an internship, hmm? uh, unpaid in most cases, or with very, very small pay, just the trip to work or so. And, if you don't have parents or someone or a spouse or whatever supporting you, giving you a sort of small basic income in order to enable you to do that, you are simply forced to take then uh, another job which doesn't correspond to your skills, which is not. And of course, most of the people who don't have the parents behind them to enable them to do that are forced to do that. And so they, they worked hard, their family worked hard in order to pay for their studies and they end up doing uh, jobs that don't correspond to their skills because they have no option and they, had no, they, they couldn't afford uh, an internship uh, that would have enabled them to improve their skills and get, and, and get a skilled job. So that with even a modest basic income of 300 euros, 400 euros per month, this enables you to wait a bit and to combine your, uh, uh, to, 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 so to combine your, the small income you have with a small additional income you may get from a job that is worth doing because it provides you, as internships should do, don't always do, uh, with a job that provides you with uh, further skills. So these were the two things I want, uh, among the many I learned, I learned you also learn a lot of things in the corridors and so or in the Weinstube and uh, after the sessions, but among those that struck me and that were sort of uh, went through uh, various workshops, these were certainly very central. So this these three ways of connecting, quite significantly distinct from each other, of connecting green concerns with basic income, and then this crucial aspect, including in our discussions on the European Citizens Initiative and so on, the importance of coupling universality and unconditionality. We don't want, uh, mean, of course, we may want it as, as a first step, but we don't want something that's just an unconditional uh, 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 basic income but remains means-tested means and we don't want a universal one that, um, th that would uh, have this strong conditionality and the sanctions attached to it. Let me just, ju just there to conclude that I must say uh, as like Klaus Soffer and Guy Standing and a couple of others in, in the room so uh, we were present in this conference in Louvain-la-Neuve in 86 and must say, I never imagined when I typed on a typewriter and then put in an envelope these uh, 25 letters or so, which I sent to various people in Europe, I had more or less detected to say, why don't you come in September 86 to Louvain-la-Neuve? Uh, it will be cheap uh, student rooms to accommodate you. It will be low budget, but we'll come together in order to think about this strange idea which we came to uh, uh, through different paths. 
That's, and I never imagined that it would lead to this sort of thing. And so it's not without emotion, I'm sure Klaus and Guy think in the same way, but how amazing, I mean, all the energy, the enthusiasm, the organizational know-how, competence that is put into the preparation of uh, and the, the, the actual running of events uh, like this is just amazing. Of course, on the other hand, you must think, well, how much progress has there been made towards basic income since then? And is there anything of it that is, has anything to do with what we have been trying to do? Well, probably not that much. But at the age I've now reached, we've now reached people the older generation here, well, we must realize that many of the things we've been doing, struggling for, will only come uh, to fruition, uh, will only be accomplished uh, after we've gone, after we'll be gone. Well, that's, that's fine the way it is. It will be thanks to the younger people uh, among you, uh, which we've helped make aware, a little bit helped make aware of the importance of some ideas, of the arguments against it, of some objections against it uh, that uh, we think need considering. If thanks to that, then things will happen. If these things happen for the good after we've gone, there are still good things, and that's what matters, not the fact that we'll be able to witness them. So thank you very, very much to every single one among you, uh, from the famous one to the less famous one, to the young ones, to the oldest ones, for all you do for our common cause.